workshop called Imagining the Future of Work in an AI-Driven World. You're at the right place. Uh, and we're not going to have any, uh, well, I'm going to joke for later. But thank you very much for coming. This is an exciting workshop for us, uh, and there's a history behind it. And we, uh, we're going to give you a more update on that. As the world basically is going more and more towards generative AI and AI and machine learning, we're asking the questions and you're being asking a question yourself about where we're going as a society and how we're going to be living that world and what it means to live in that world. There is a larger project they're going to be talking to you about, which is in form of a film festival or a film challenge called Our Future Lab. The goal is to identify positive futures that we like to see, that we desire to see, that keep our human values intact. And that's a larger project. And in preparation for that project, we have been doing a number of workshops. Uh, and these workshops are basically about focusing how we can understand the future. Today's a focus on future work because AI has a huge impact on work and we're gonna be diving in. Next slide, please. Hi, yes. So oh, I'm uh, my name's Katrona Sari. I'm executive director of the Task Platform here at the uh, here at the, here in Geneva, down the road at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Um, one housekeeping piece: if anyone can't hear us, we're in this rather formal room, which means that we have these special microphones to use. So you've each got an earpiece on your desk and a microphone in front of you. If you put the little ear symbol to uh, change it until you see the word floor, then you'll be able to hear all the speakers through your own microphones. Uh, so that's a little piece of housekeeping. When we come to the interactive part later, if you want to feed back to the panel, you can also do the same, add it to floor and, and press the speak button at the front to, to interact with us. Um, so, I'm executive director of the task platform. We're really de delighted to be working with our future life to uh, support the initiative that you're all helping us brainstorm today uh, and to, uh, to co-convene this workshop together with Amir. Uh, a couple of words about the task platform. We're supported by the Swiss government and hosted at the Graduate Institute as an open platform for innovation, collaboration, um, information and connection around large-scale societal transformations. Um, we're rooted in international Geneva with an intention to bring together the, uh, the multilateral organizations with academia, with civil society, uh, and with business to, uh, to cross-pollinate on issues that are affecting all of us but are often dealt with in, in their separate silos, um, and to help think a step further than the current uh, polycrisis we face today into what the implications for the future would be. We try to bridge timelines, we try to bridge topics, and we try to bridge different uh, communities, uh, and I think our future life is a, a real example of bringing that kind of connection uh, of different modes of thinking uh, and different subject matter to life. Um, about the workshop today, uh, next slide please. <laughs> We, uh, we're really aiming for an interactive discussion. So we're going to kick off the day with a, uh, an expert panel where you'll hear about, hear about artificial intelligence, its implications for the future of work and the future of creativity. Um, we're going to attempt a, a very interactive hands-on breakout session with all of you. So be ready to swivel in your chairs and, uh, and get stuck into a conversation. Um, also playing with uh, generative AI along the way. Um, and then we'll come back and speak about the, the results later on. Before we do that, I want to hand back to Amir to tell us uh, a little bit more about the Our Future in Life initiative, uh, which is the, the impetus behind this, this gathering and conversation. Uh, next slide, next please. Slide. And I usually don't introduce myself because I forget about it, but <laughs> my name is Amir Benefetimi. I'm director of an organization called AI Commons, which is a nonprofit that is working toward bringing AI to human values and making AI a force for good. I was one of the co-founders of AI for Good Summit, which are attending here seven years ago. And with help of ITU, we basically grew this to a very large organization. Our future life came out of a conversation with uh, Stuart Russell in uh, 2019. We're talking about uh, finding positive futures that AI can bring. And the idea was to create one movie, and then that idea, one movie became a challenge to incentivize any of us to create a movie of the future. What do you want the future to look like? So it's an imagination challenge. And if tomorrow were based on imagination, what do we look like? Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. So the core question is that how humans will thrive, create value and meaning in our collective future. And if AI is everywhere, how are we gonna have a sense of purpose, identity and human values? What are human meet, needs that are met or unmet and how AI is gonna be jeopardizing and changing that? And today we're talking more about work, which is one of the foundation of our identity and how it shapes us and how we're gonna be evolving. Next slide, please. And the core question also was that, how can we imagine a world where humans are not uncertain, but purposeful? So for that, next slide, please. We try to uh, do the best thing we can is to imagine it together instead of predicting. This is not a prediction or forecasting exercise as an imagination and visualization exercise about how do you want work to be in the future, how we want life to shape up in the future, and how we can collectively uh, build it together, all of us. Next slide, please. Uh, no, next slide, please, again. So that's why we're creating a global imagination challenge. This is not a marketing term. We figure out a way we're going to be announcing it this fall. Uh, but really is to inspire everyone to come up with a very short story about a life they see themselves in, in the future. Another prediction. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about what our life looks in terms of work and what work, work could mean for us in the future. And we're going to share with you some examples of some volunteers took on and created some short videos about that future. And we're going to be doing it collectively as well to learn how we can project and imagine that future together. So that's the basic, the background of what we're doing. But in the context of AI for Good, over the past six and a half years, we've pretty much tackled every type of problems that AI can solve for, from SDGs to policymaking to environment. And we learned a lot. What we have not heard or learned is that how humans imagine that future. And maybe that's the time also to have that data set, that voice in, in our conversations. Next slide, please. So yeah, future told by people. Next slide, I think we're good to, uh, to the agenda of the day. Uh, you wanna go to the agenda or should I go ahead? Uh, either way, I can, I can do it, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so you're hearing uh, Amir and I welcoming you and setting the scene right now. Then we'll go to our, our opening panel discussion, where we're really delighted to have uh, Stuart Russell and Marie LaSalle joining us, moderated by Olivier Desiborg. And uh, Olivier will, will make full introductions uh, a little later to that conversation. Um, we're together for a few hours, so you'll be relieved that we have a couple of breaks built in. Um, where uh, you can take a comfort break, fill up your water bottles, come back in and join us again um, for the screening of the short films that Amir mentioned. We've been running a little competition through the Graduate Institutes over the last few weeks, um, and we'll show you our, uh, our top picks from that uh, competition as uh, inspiration to go into our breakout sessions. Uh, we'll have another short break and then come back for a discussion of what of the insights and challenges that we experienced through those breakouts. Um, and then we'll wrap up by around six o'clock. Wonderful. Thank you. Olivier, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for hosting this panel. Thank you very much, Amir. Sorry, can you hear me well now? Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'm a science journalist working for the Swiss public broadcaster, uh, Radio Television Suisse here in Geneva. Um, I know I'm here for quite some time because we had projects together in the, in the recent past. And I'll be your moderator for the first and the last part of the afternoon. As you know now, uh, there's gonna be three parts. One now uh, as the first panel, then the, the breakout session, and then the discussion about what you will be uh, discussing during the, the breakout session. So. During this first part, we'll try to set the stage with our two distinguished guests, which I will uh, present to you in a, in a minute, and try to, uh, to see what's happening now. How will AI uh, totally or not totally change the world of work? What does that mean? What will the future of work look like uh, in this world where AI is taking so much space and, and importance? I won't come back now on the breakout session because you will hear more details uh, right afterwards. And I won't make a long introduction because uh, the, the two experts I have on my left are much better than me at this. But just this small introduction, uh, preparing this, this afternoon, 
I fell on this very interesting study, so I don't know if you can show it, otherwise you, you will have the link in the chat or somewhere. It's a study done last year um, at EPFL here in Lausanne at University of Lausanne. Um, and the title goes, how to compete with robots by assessing, assessing jobs, automation risks and resilient uh, alternatives. And this is important, you'll see why. So what the scientists did is actually they tried to combine the, the scientific and technical literature on robotic ab abilities first with employment and wage statistics. Um, they then developed a method to calculate which of the currently existing jobs are more at risk uh, of being performed by machines in the near future. And actually they worked on the, the capacities that all jobs have and checked which capacity could, could be replaced by robots or AI in each job on a list of about 1000, which is quite a, a huge amount. So you might ask yourself, what are the results? So I wonder if there are any physicists in the room, please raise your hand. So no physicist, well, me, I'm a physicist by training. <laughs> um, because physicists rank top on this list, right? They have a, a very kind of a low risk of being replaced by robots, 44% uh, risk. I won't go into the details of the, of the numbers. And at the very bottom of this, this list, uh, you have uh, the, the job of meat packer. <laughs> Um, okay, it's not very surprising. In the middle, in general jobs, um, in food processing, building, maintenance, construction have the highest risks, risks, meaning they have the right risks to be replaced by robots. An interesting result is that um, the, the mean value, how would you estimate the mean value of this risk to be if you take this list of 1,000 and if you take exactly the middle? Marie-Laure said 60, and she was not far. It's 62, so 62 is the mean value for uh, this risk in, in this list of uh, 1,000. And what's interesting is that the scientists did, did that study last year in 22, and in, in between we had what? We had ChatGPT and all the, and all the likes. So they redid the calculation this year, and now they raised this risk, this mean value risk to 67% in just a few months. And probably this risk will rise further uh, if we take into account the next generations of, uh, of um, generative AI and, and large language uh, models. But what's interesting is that scientists went further. They proposed a method to, to find for each job, each occupation, a possible transition to other but similar jobs that would maximize the reduction in the automation risk for those people, while also minimizing the retraining, the, the transition, the adaptation effort. And actually, they tested this method on the US workforce composition and showed that actually um, it could substantially reduce uh, the workers' automation risks while the associated adaptation effort would be moderate. In other words, and to conclude, um, actually, this shows it well, this study is very theoretical, right? But it shows kind of a, that there are ways, there are solutions to include wisely AI in the future of work without too many damages. And we'll see. How maybe with the two guests? It shows actually that there's a possible resilience in all this, right? And of course, this is theoretical, but at least with statistics here, this has been shown. So to dive into um, into that topic more deeply, we now have the pleasure to to hear from two very distinguished guests, experts on the on the topic. And I will start with Stuart Russell. Um, he's a world-renowned professor at uh, the universities of uh, Berkeley and Stanford, and uh, I think I. Don't have to present you further and just give you the floor. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Olivier. So um, I guess I'm here to pick your brains. Uh, this is about, uh, as uh, Amir pointed out, this is about imagination. It's about figuring out a world that you would like your children to grow up in. Um, and uh, we need to do that. Everyone is talking about transition plans, but you can't have a transition plan unless you have a place to transition to uh, that you actually want to get to. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just go through some of the basic arguments and let me state up front, I'm not an economist, mm -hmm. uh, but I think almost everything I have to say has been pre-approved by economists uh, who have read through various versions of this talk over the years. Um, so if I could go to the next slide. Uh, so AI is about making intelligent machines. 
uh, next. So what we typically mean by that is machines that, uh, that act in order to achieve objectives. So AlphaGo is given the objective of winning the game. Uh, you know, your sat nav, your, your GPS on your phone uh, is given the objective of finding the shortest route to your destination. Uh, and they do a great job of these things. Next. And um, what we've been trying to do since the beginning is to create general purpose AI. Uh, that means AI that essentially exceeds human capabilities along every dimension. So mostly I'm going to be talking about general purpose AI. Uh, the study that Olivier cited is talking about our present understanding of AI as it exists today and in the next few years, which is important. Um, but social policy, educational policy, science policy takes decades to take effect. And so thinking about what's going to happen in the next five years and whose jobs are at risk uh, is, is not going to lead to effective changes uh, in those types of policies. Next. So a question that people have asked on and off since the beginning of AI is what happens if we succeed in this task? Mostly we haven't paid attention to this question because AI has been extremely difficult. Uh, but now I think people are starting to ask this question again. Uh, if we had general purpose AI, then by definition, we can do what humans can already do. Uh, one of the things humans can do is create a civilization that at least for some fraction of people on earth uh, provides a decent level of comfort, security, quality of life. So let's say we could use general purpose AI to do that on a bigger scale at much less cost next. So then we could lift everyone's living standards to, to that respectable level. Next. If we count the what economists call the net present value, the cash equivalent of that increased standard of living, it gives you a sense of what general purpose AI is worth as a technology. And it comes to about 13 and a half quadrillion dollars. So that's with a Q. Don't see Q very often in uh, amounts of money, but this is actually a conservative estimate because, of course, we could have next we could have much uh, we could have much better civilization than the one next slide. Uh, we could we could have a much better civilization. Right? We could have much better healthcare than we currently do. Much more personalized education. Uh, I think we're already seeing faster progress in science and. Maybe this is just wishful thinking. We could have better politics. So next. So this issue that we're going to talk about today is, well, what will humans do? If AI is delivering this civilization, what are humans going to do? So here's a quotation. If every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touched the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants, which would obviously cause massive unemployment. Next. So this is Aristotle writing in 350 BC. So this is not a new idea. This is not a new problem. Uh, automation uh, could, at least in the near term, I think it was obvious to Aristotle, create uh, a problem of unemployment. But for most of the history of economics, uh, and, and partly based on some examples like the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, which did replace a very large number of workers uh, with machinery of various kinds, uh, we saw that employment, although it did uh, suffer in the near term, came back to at least a higher level and mostly with more interesting uh, and higher paying jobs uh, afterwards. Next. But if general purpose AI, AI is going to do all the jobs, right, this, this is uh, the sort of default picture, I think, in the imagination of most people, right? And this is from Wall-E, where the machines run human civilization. This is sort of everybody is on giant space cruise ships. Uh, and because they have lost the incentive to know how to run their own civilization, they have lost the incentive to learn, 
They have broken that chain of learning that goes back tens of thousands of generations, even to pre-human species. So we have technology that we have inherited from pre-human species. It's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And that chain breaks when the incentive to pass it to the next generation and the incentive for the next generation to learn it goes away, right? And this is what's underlying Wally's picture of the future where human beings are infantilized and enfeebled uh, by this process. So this is sort of the one end of the spectrum about what we uh, hope to avoid uh, as AI becomes more and more capable. Next slide. So one response that I often hear from governments is, oh, then uh, we should start these retraining programs to uh, retrain everybody as data scientists. Next slide. So they imagine vast fields of data scientists. Uh, next, right? As you can imagine, this is not a complete solution. Um, you know, I, I was talking to somebody in the government of Singapore that, you know, maybe this isn't a complete solution to the unemployment problem for billions of people. And they said, well, that's true. We agree with you, but Singapore is very small. So, so we can fit in the lifeboat, even though the rest of the cruise ship uh, can't fit in the lifeboat. Uh, so that's one point of view. But I think it's clear that we do not need 2 billion, 3 billion data scientists. Uh, and so this is not a, a scalable solution. Next. So we hear a lot of uh, wishful thinking, particularly from companies whose main uh, business model is putting people out of work. Uh, next. So one thing you'll hear is AI will empower humans and not replace them. Next. AI will automate tasks, not jobs, as if somehow when all the tasks you do have gone away, you're still going to have a job, right? Next, uh, this is a very common one. AI will do all the tedious tasks, leaving you more time for the interesting parts, right? So imagine that you're a radiologist. So AI is now doing all the routine fractures. So I guess patients are going to start breaking their bones in more interesting ways just, mm -hmm. just to keep the radiologist busy? No. I mean, this, this doesn't make any sense. Um, next. So here's, here's the underlying thesis that we get from economists. And this is a real economist speaking. Any advance that increases labor productivity also tends to raise the demand for labor and thus employment and wages. Right? So this is axiomatic in classical economics. Uh, and classical economists will deny that technological unemployment is possible, except perhaps in a very short-term transition period. Next. So let's do a little thought experiment. Next. We have AI systems that, you know, they're probably not the thing we would actually create, but imagine that we make a technology that simply creates a twin of every person. Next. And um, the twin shows up to your job, whether it's your current job or a new one. Next. And um, the important point about this twin, besides being more cheerful and less hungover, is that they are willing to work for nothing. Right? Who among you thinks that you will keep your job under that circumstance? Right? It's not going to happen. Next. Right? So. Um, so in a sense, the axiom is still correct. There will be more employment. It just won't be employment of human beings. It will be employment of their substitutes. Next. So let's go through a particular technology, painting houses, right? I like, I like concrete examples. So we're going to talk about painting houses. So on the y-axis, we have the number of house painters who are employed in house painting. And on the x-axis, we have technology increasing to the right. And I'm representing technology by a simple number, which is how wide is your paintbrush, right? So next, the earliest stages of paintbrush technology, these are very, very tiny paintbrushes, right? And it's so expensive to paint a house that, you know, maybe the emperor gets his house painted, but nobody else can afford it. And then we get to a millimeter, 
And maybe a few of the nobles get their house, their mansions painted. And then we get to a centimeter, you know, wealthy merchants, few company headquarters get theirs painted. Next. All right. Then we get into the then we get next, then we get into the realm of practicality, right? You know, sort of real substantial paintbrushes. And now it's becoming very common for ordinary people to get their house painted. And the number of house painters increases dramatically. So far, so good. Technology is creating unemployment and not reducing it. Next. But then we get up to, you know, spray guns and big paint rollers and house painters are getting more productive, but people don't need their houses painted every six weeks. So as the uh, demand saturates, the number of people employed in house painting starts to drop. Next. Next. So as we get to robotic systems where one painting supervisor has a hundred house painting robots at their disposal and they can go and paint a house in an hour, the number of human house painters drops off dramatically. So the important point here is it's not about technology. It's about demand for what the technology can produce. And early in the development of the technology, employment increases. In the late stages with saturation of demand, employment decreases. And this uh, next, this inverted U curve, next, this inverted U curve has been actually measured empirically in many major industries, in steel, in car manufacturing, in shipbuilding. This happens over and over again. And with general purpose AI, it will simply happen in every area of economic activity. Next. So when, when AI people talk to economists and, you know, we all have the same goal, right? Which is to use AI in ways that, that don't create massive unemployment. The economists will tell us, okay, there's two types of AI technologies. There's complementing technologies and there's substituting technologies. And as long as you develop complementing technologies, then uh, things will go well. So we ask, okay, what's a, what exactly is, how do I tell if a technology is complementing? Next. Well, they'll say complementing means it increases employment and substituting means it decreases employment. That doesn't help us very much. Next. In fact, these adjectives, these categories are not properties of a technology. It depends on the elasticity of demand. If everybody lived in big houses, then the introduction of paint rollers would probably still lead to increased employment, right? But if everybody lived in small houses, then paintbrushes would be enough to paint houses fairly cheaply and uh, as often as people want. And so paint rollers, which increased productivity, would end up replacing workers and reducing employment. So the effect of a technology depends on the circumstance in which it's introduced and uh, the elasticity of demand. So it's not a property of the technology per se. So I cannot look at a piece of AI and say, yep, this is complementing or yep, this is substituting. I have to understand the socio-technical embedding of that technology. This is absolutely essential. So one piece of advice next would be, uh, find areas that are right at the beginning of that upward slope, right? And that would be needs that are unmet because they're too expensive to meet with humans or they're too dangerous to meet with humans or they're just physically impossible to meet with humans. Uh, and some examples of that uh, would appear to be uh, delivering uh, education and healthcare in countries that currently can't afford to do that for their people, right? Uh, so these are countries where the annual healthcare or education budget might be $10 per person, right? So there, there's a massive unmet need uh, and uh, AI can meet that need and will actually make it possible for many more people to be involved in delivering education and healthcare. Uh, to meet those needs. Uh, inspecting uh, shipping containers, 
for contraband and weapons and drugs. We currently don't do this because it's too expensive. Cleaning up graffiti in cities. There are many cities that literally gave up. It's just too expensive to clean up the graffiti. Uh, and those cities are disfigured uh, and that actually creates a spiral uh, of blight that we could actually intervene in if we had cheap robotic technology for cleaning up graffiti and so on. So I'm not, you know, I'm not someone uh, who has qualifications to think about these things, but I'm sure that many of you will come up with good ideas. Next. But we still have to ask, okay, in the long run, right, all of those U curves are going to end up uh, on the far right-hand end. Um, and this is just a fact, right? We've been using people as robots for 10,000 years. Since the hunter-gatherer where you know, everyone sort of chipped in on everything kind of uh, existence to the beginning of organized agriculture where large numbers of people were used in uh, narrow physical occupations that did not uh, in any way tap into their potential as human beings. So we've been using people as robots for 10,000 years. And if you went back to hunter-gatherer time and you said, you know what, in the future, people will go into these buildings that have no windows and they'll do the same thing 20,000 times a day. And they'll do that every day of their lives, pretty much until they die, right? You would be laughed out of the village, right? People would say, well, you're, that's ridiculous, right? And that nobody would ever go, go along with that kind of idea, right? But that's exactly what we did. And now we're upset that this is going away. But it's going away. Next. Right? There won't be a market for routine human physical labor and routine human mental labor. Right? Just as horses lost their economic viability at the beginning of the 20th century, and vast numbers of them were turned into pet food. Right? There was not new jobs for those horses. We have got to figure out what is the role other than to be characters in the Wall-E movie. Next. Uh, and this problem has been put forward by many people. Here's Keynes in 1930. For the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem. How to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science will have won for him to live wisely and agreeably and well. And it's quite interesting, Keynes goes on to talk about those who are skilled in the art of living as opposed to those who are basically striving. He, he has a sort of aristocratic disdain for people who strive uh, and thinks that that's a habit that will, the human race will soon lose. And he thinks that's a good thing. Uh, I don't agree. I actually think that there's a fundamental human need to, uh, to challenge oneself uh, to feel uh, engaged, valued, productive uh, in various ways. Next. And it seems to me that the, the section that's left, if it's not routine mental and physical labor, uh, is interpersonal roles. Either roles where we want human beings to fill those roles. Like I want a human being to have lunch with me. I don't want to have lunch with a robot, right? And I want, maybe I'll want to have lunch with someone who's really good at having lunch, who just leaves me feeling great, uh, who makes sure I don't drink too much, who uh, gives me inspiration, leaves me feeling uh, that, I have, that I have lots of, lots to do in the afternoon, right? There will be professional lunches. Uh, you've probably seen this sort of large, uh, large scale emergence of life coaching and executive coaching and all that kind of thing. These are interpersonal roles that are not dependent, it's not caregiving, which involves a notion of dependence. Uh, these are interpersonal roles, next. But for those to have high value, they have to be effective. They have to deliver value to the recipient, next. Um, and we don't know how to do that, right? We have about a trillion dollars invested in this thing, right? 
trillion dollars of research and development to create this amazing device. Well, not clear if it if it's making people's lives better, but it's pretty amazing. But we have, in comparison, invested virtually nothing in the human sciences, which is what we need in order that people can deliver high value in interpersonal roles. So it seems to me that this is a massive change in our science space, our education system, the professions that we need to create, uh, and the economic structure uh, that will facilitate all these roles. Because it doesn't seem like it's going to be giant corporations hiring people by the million. Next. So to summarize, um, just go through one at a time. Uh, first of all, uh, I think the idea that we could just stop AI uh, is pretty difficult to imagine. Um, next. Uh, that as AI proceeds, particularly towards general purpose AI, it's really going to challenge our current system and the roles that people have within that system. Next. Um, and I would lastly like to say, wishful thinking is not the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, for those very insightful uh, thoughts, which I'm sure will feed the the reflection, the brainstormings in the in the workshop. I now leave the floor to um, Marie Lorsal. Uh, she used to be the director of Sciences Po uh, School of Management in Paris, and now she's kind of a famous figure in international Geneva because she's running, she's directing the Graduate Institute uh, nearby. Marie, Marie Laure, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, good afternoon uh, to, to all of us. Thank you very much, Stuart, for, for this uh, presentation. So I will be, in a sense, answering to Stuart, but not in a very direct way. So, uh, you know, I will have follow my own thread, but some of what I'm going to, to be saying are going de def to be definitely uh, reactions and, and answers, uh, or not really answers, because I don't think it's the right word, but really reactions to, to what we just heard. But let me start with, with a more general introduction uh, with a focus. I would like us to reflect a few minutes on uh, what does work represent for humanity. And I would like to do that uh, from different perspective. In the Bible, if you all remember, uh, work is in fact a curse uh, imposed on humanity as the price that humanity has to pay for the downfall that humanity has brought upon itself. There's no work in paradise. For the vast majority of us today, uh, on the other hand, for the vast majority of humanity, work is an absolute sine qua non condition for survival. It's not only that, but it is also that for vast, vast majority of humanity today, uh, absolute sine qua non condition for survival. I'm si insisting on that because this is going to be one of the core of my, of, of my arguments. And it's actually um, a sine qua non condition for survival, including through unemployment or retirement benefits, because unemployment and retirement benefits, which lead us in periods of non-work, de depend on us having worked. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a really important uh, point to, to remember. On the other side, think about, and, and you know, uh, the Wally picture uh, makes us uh, think a bit uh, about this. Think about um, uh, Thorsten Veblen's uh, notion of um, capital uh, and the aggregation of capital being actually a means to which we can free ourselves from work. Going to back to certain kinds of paradise, which is what he calls the leisure class. Um, so this work, this book was written by Veblen in 1899. And both actually a commentary, but also quite a, um, a, a relatively negative commentary on what he was seeing happening, which was in fact uh, the extraction from the world of work by a small class of cap essentially capitalists and, and aggregate people who have managed to aggregate enough value to actually go out of work and turn to um, conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure uh, version of paradise, which, you know, I think we could see the Wally picture as the, you know, a new version of paradise. I'm putting a lot of uh, quotes here, obviously. Um, 
And then finally, last but not least, uh, there's uh, Mark's vision of work. And Mark's vision of work is quite interesting because Mark's vision of work is that when, you know, it makes a difference between alienated work and non-alienated work. And for Marx, actually work when it's not alienated is in fact the essence of humanity and the driving force of self-realization and freedom which is very different from the leisure cons and, and the leisure uh, and the consumption, uh, conspicuous consumption picture, uh, or even of the Bible picture, which on the contrary sees that the, the you know, uh, essence of humanity is a curse. Uh, in that case, um, work becomes not a curse, but a self-realization, really the essence of, of who we are. So we've heard about uh, St uh, from Stuart about the probable future of work ahead of us uh, in the context of what uh, Stuart has described as the unstoppable progress of AI. And that I think is one of the questions we need to discuss, but I'll come to that uh, a bit later, wh whether this is so unstoppable as we uh, you know, uh, define it uh, today. The, the reflections I'm going to propose are both reactions to Stuart's, but also obviously um, you know, reflect, <clears throat> reflect a lot of our own uh, discussions work at the Graduate Institute on, on, on those issues, because we are actually uh, in the context of the Tech Hub, which is uh, led by Jérôme, who's sitting here. Uh, we're working a lot uh, on, on uh, the transform technological transformation and its societal, political, geopolitical impact um, in, in, in the current uh, world. So the Panglossian, you know, very optimistic, radically optimist utopia. Uh, if we think about the future of work and AI, could be that um, all alienating forms of work, and in fact, um, you know, all forms of work maybe all together, get transferred to the machine and the algorithm, the artificial intelligence, and then at some point becomes the question of what is left for us. So whether the Wally picture or the Marxist picture, which I'll take as the positive version, where we find you know, self-realizations in all kinds of activities, uh, uh, but that are not alienated. Um, this optimist scenario, however, and I think this is really the crux of, of, the, of the rest of my argument, implies if it, if it were to happen or if it would happen, uh, implies a profound transformation of our economic and social organization, a transformation that would make it possible to decorrelate our capacity to survive from work. Remember this point that I made before. And, and you know, whether we talk about then the Wally or Marxist scenario, but the key here is, are we able to transform our societies uh, and at, what, at which speed in a way that we are able to decorrelate our capacity to survive as human beings uh, from work. In the short medium term, I think that a lot of you will agree with me, uh, this represents a major, in fact, um, um, you know, this represents quite, quite, quite a challenge that I'm not sure that I see happening, you know. Um, it's a major, a radical unweaving of our current economic and social system, because our current economic and social system rests on uh, work, consumption, uh, so production and consumption uh, and production being, you know, where work takes place. So, you know, how do we unweave this? That's, I think, the, the core of the question that we, we have to, to ask and whether or not it can happen in the long term. Why not? But in the medium to uh, small to medium term, term, you will agree with me that it's bound to be very complex uh, and, and very bumpy. So the optimist scenario is not a probable future, at, not, at least not in the short to, to medium uh, term. Uh, and as long as we do not engage uh, strongly in this deep dynamic transformation, which I indeed don't see any sign of, uh, or, or very, very few signs of anywhere, uh, I, I don't really believe uh, that it will happen. Um, so rather a probable, probable future, if we do nothing and keep actually in the direction of, of where um, we are, uh, is, um, probably a, a series of things like deepen, deepening systemic systemic and systematic inequalities. I mean, uh, Stuart has given us a very uh, important number, which was that um, the, the presence of AI and development of AI could mean a 10% increase in world GDP. If you look actually- uh, oh, Sorry, thousand percent. Sorry? Thousand percent. Oh, it was a thousand percent. Yes. 
10 X. Okay, sorry. So I tried 10 times. Okay, a thousand increase in Okay. So we've had a major increase in world GDP if you consider, you know, the media, uh, media the middle ages to today. Quite a radical increase in uh, world GDP. Not to that extent, I agree, but a radical one. And ultimately, this has not uh, suppressed, uh, quite to the contrary, you would argue, if you look at the recent figures, inequalities of a vast scale. And so, you know, increasing the world GDP is not the only uh, thing that needs to happen if we are going to go towards a solution where human beings can live like, uh, you know, Marxist philosophers and uh, and uh, cattle uh, rarers um, if, uh, you know, we go back to the capital. Um, so inequalities are bound to increase uh, if, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the scenario, if we keep going where, where we are going, uh, generating economic and social exclusion on an unprecedented scale, in an unprecedented scale. I think the 60%, 67% uh, mentioned by Olivier shows that, uh, furthermore, this is actually bound to uh, have an impact on all of us, whatever our jobs differently, but nevertheless, all except for the physicists, which are happy. Still 44 and maybe I would add the philosophers. That's really weird they didn't look at the philosophers because I don't see how I could uh, replace philosophers. But okay, nevertheless, almost all of us would would, um, would be impacted uh, by that. Yuval Noah Ahari talks about the emergence of a useless class. What if almost all of us become useless um, in the current systemic dependence? On, of survival, of our survival on work, this necessarily implies for a large share of humanity, more economic and social hardships coming with exclusion, deeper divides, still greater inequalities, the progress of poverty and the absence of a capacity to project oneself in the future, particularly for young generations. You've all seen probably what's been happening in French suburbs uh, very recently, and I would argue here that what's what has been happening in French uh, suburbs, but also in Belgium to, to some extent, even in Lausanne, in fact, um, or what's happening in many war zones across the world, or what's happening also in uh, some of uh, at the heart of uh, some American cities today with a, a very uh, rapid increase of drug consumption with major uh, dramatic consequences from there are all in different ways, examples of what exclusion, inequalities, lack of positive projections are bound to generate. Uh, and we know that the social ills, uh, and we know what the social ills imply politically because we've seen it uh, develop over the last uh, decade or even a bit more. They imply the progress of populism, they imply the return of authoritarian regimes and geopolitical confrontations. So, you know, with, with respect to those dimensions, in fact, if you look at the history of humanity, we get as close to uh, sociological laws as possible. You know, whether or not there are sociological laws is a matter for debate, but what I'm telling you about uh, those uh, connections here is as close to sociological laws as, as we get. So just imagine that you multiply this tenfold or even more, I don't know how, how that would be, if we let AI do the destructive part of a possibly, I still need to be convinced, creative destruction dynamics. Before we reach the creative phase of those dynamics, which is this you know, uh, new version of paradise um, that we discussed, or, um, or, or the Wally scenario, one or the other, uh, we cannot escape the destructive phase. An ever-expanding useless class globally that becomes pushed by technology to the margins of the world of work, which in our current society means being pushed to the periphery of humanity, and then what? The most violent, looted upheaval of human history, uh, a universal basic income for all, but probably with a relatively basic uh, type of uh, survival uh, mechanism here. Um, is that what we really dream for our own species? Is that what we could call social progress? And I've not even brought in the discussion, I need to bring it here now, the dramatic ecological impact of an unchecked or ungoverned push to AI. We know that this technological revolution is very costly in energy terms, but also in terms of some of the non-replenishable resources like rare earth and critical minerals that it needs to deploy itself. Weirdly enough, it seems to me, we do not talk about this quite enough. 
let me point here to some of the key issues. First, the overall limits of known and exploited resources when we compare them to the needs associated with the digital, but also to the ecological transition. For example, if we focus on the latter, latter we know that the ecological transition needs uh, through the digital part also, in, uh, including through the digital part, a lot of those rare earths. If we focus on that, and if we are indeed targeting uh, to stick to a two degree uh, scenario, we know already that known reserves, including ongoing projects, will only allow to cover half of our needs in lithium and cobalt and 80% of our needs in copper from now till 2030. 2030 is tomorrow, obviously. According to Olivier Vidal from the Institut des Sciences de la Terre de Grenoble, if we consider our needs in the coming 20 years on, on those rare um, minerals, one generation will be consuming as much as the previous 2,500 ones of those mineral resources that are both very rare and very slow, obviously, to replenish. Naturally, there are frontiers like space and deep sea mining, um, where there's hope to find more of those uh, rare minerals. But we know also that the exploitation of these resources will represent both major ecological risks, but also major geopolitical threats. The large scale extraction of minerals such as manganese, cobalt, nickel, and other rare earth elements from deep seabeds has the potential to come with major geopolitical conflicts, but it also has the potential to cause devastating harm to the marine environment. In the current context, where the production of rare earth is strongly dominated by China, it's very clear that some of the next wars will be around critical minerals. They are definitely our new oil. In fact, one question we may ask ourselves at this moment is whether the projection of this unstoppable progress of AI, um, of AI replacing and displacing most jobs, is in fact in the medium term or even long term possible beyond the previous question of whether it is desirable if we consider the limited availability on our planet of these critical minerals that are absolutely necessary for this deployment. So I think that's also a question we should um, uh, ask ourselves. So what, does, what is to, to be done? Um, it seems dramatically urgent to me to regain control over the ways in which we deploy this technological revolution. The idea is not to uh, throw the baby with the bathwater, but it's to regain control over the way we deploy um, the technological revolution. It is for all of us an existential necessity. None of us can be protected from the combination of ecological and social disaster that is looming ahead if we do not, as a species, rethink the conditions for this technological revolution to serve us rather than us humans being sacrificed on the altar of technological development and end up like this woolly picture, which really is the most uh, you know, frightening sight I've seen in quite some time. Uh, we have to find the ways for our species to keep the driver's seat and we should simply not accept the self-fulfilling prophecy of artificial intelligence destroying human intelligence. Governance at the global, global level is key, uh, but we probably, probably need to go beyond this. We also have to rethink ahead of the curve our relationship to work, which probably also implies a redefinition of our relationship to the current form of conspicuous consumption that defines our economic and social organization. Without this intermediary phase, the doom scenario is unavoidable. I'm also going to uh, uh, agree very much with the, the idea that obviously education is also another key um, element and mechanism of action. Uh, education, in particular education, so that we can keep abreast of the technology and we can keep a technology under control, which implies in particular uh, thinking about those issues at the moment of the development of the future generation of producers of the technology. So including those questions, and here I couldn't agree more with the fact that human sciences and social sciences need much more financing and need, much, need to be much more integrated into uh, the training of future generations of engineers and, and um, technology de developers. And that's something that at the Institute, at least we are very um, keen to, to, uh, to push uh, and forward. Um, so those are, you know, um, let me just say that the, the type of deep transformation that, that I mentioned, which is maybe the most, uh, you know, utopian part of, of the whole discussion, which is really how do we, um, uh, how do we question progressively our relationship to work so that we get ready for, for the technology in a sense, but slowly without 
uh, destroying two or three generations of, of humans, or, or even actually leading to uh, an implosion, a social implosion, or an ecological implosion that, that would actually alter all this uh, in, in, the, in the meantime. This is uh, obviously uh, implies a number of things. It implies um, a number of things that are already being discussed huh, a, a bit everywhere. The first one being the deep transformation of our economic system and its driving narrative. We have to move from the maximization of shareholder value as supposedly driving general welfare, which we know now has turned out to be a dangerous myth to the preservation and production of common goods and the renewal of, of those common goods, goods as the only sustainable source of value creation for the individual and the collective. Hence, we need to transform our relationship to the environment from essentially extractive dynamics to regenerative ones, and particularly focusing on those minerals if we want to sustain this development in the long term. And finally, we certainly have to change our cultural relationship to consumption, at least in the richest parts of our world, from too much having to a little bit more of being and thinking and regaining control over our human intelligence so that we don't end up in the Wally scenario, but rather in the Marx scenario, become a Marxist. It seems kind of an interesting <laughs> uh, evolution. Um, so it's not a small task, uh, but the question is, is there really an alternative? My personal, very strongly felt answer is no. Without governing the current dynamics and without a deep transformation of our economic, social, and ecological paradigm as an essential transition phase, I do not see how we can avoid the deeply dystopic scenario that I started with, at least for the two or three generations ahead, as I said. This may sound exceedingly ambitious, but I would like to quote here Jean Monnet, the father of Europe, but also one of the key leaders at the origin of the League of Nations, in fact, who affirmed that it is an exceptional, I quote him, it is in exceptional periods that everything becomes possible. So let's make that possible. Uh, I've put those thoughts on the table for us to, to discuss and reflect, uh, but I think that it's really high time for us to become the agent of our own future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilo. I think we had two very insightful talks, which both converge to the to the to the to the need for a profound rethink, if not a reset, of our economic structure, our education system, and our whole society. Uh, we now have a quarter of hour, fifteen minutes to for questions. Um, this concerns here people in the room, of course. Please raise your hand, state who you are, and ask your questions. But also people online will try to get at least one or two questions from the online audience. Please do write them in the chat for those who watch us online, and they will be relayed here on, on stage to our speakers. I'll ask the first question, which is um, directed to, to both of you. Um, seems like the, a dark picture that you, you just described to us, or a big program, if I can say that. Uh, well. um, if you were the president of the most powerful country in the world. What would you concretely do today or tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow. Let's give you the night for a reflection to, to change that. Where to ignite that big change that you both describe in your in your in your talks? I'll let you start straight. <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, and thanks, very concretely, thank, thank you we, for starting with we, the easy we question. A, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had big ideas. Yeah. But how to to really work concretely on that? On that. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think in a in a generalized sense, things things work when they're incentive compatible, right? Trying to get thing, trying to get people to do things that they don't have an incentive to actually do, uh, isn't generally very effective. Um, but if you, if you think about um, one of the things we want to have happen is that people are engaged in work because of the value they derive from that process, not the income, but the value. And it's, as, uh, as Marie Law called it, the non-alienated work, work where uh, you feel empowered, you, you feel uh, capable, you feel valued. There are many, many uh, kinds of value that we derive from it. But at the moment, the way our economic system works, uh, if it's a job you really enjoy, I have to say I really enjoy being uh, an academic. Um, but as a result, academics don't get paid very much, right? Because people are willing to do it. Uh, working in art museums is 
notoriously underpaid because people love art and they're willing to work for almost nothing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of unpaid internships in the United Nations because people love the idea of working for the United Nations. So the U UN exploits them by paying them zero, literally, uh, to, to, to work for a year or two as, as an intern. Um, so in fact, the things sort of go almost the wrong way around. Right, the, the more value the person derives from the process of working, the less we pay them. So I think um, we need to figure out a sort of different way to arrange this so that uh, you know, em employers, so it's something that encourages employers to make work valuable and non-alienated for the people who are working. Maybe even the notion of an employer is the wrong way of thinking about this. Um, but um, you know, I'm not an economist. The vast majority of economists I talk to just think about, we have an economic system, it's not going to change. All we can do is tweak some knobs. Like we can have, you know, more unemployment insurance. Great, right? That'll really solve the problem. Or, you know, some negative income tax to encourage people to, to at the low end to, to work. Um, but tweaking knobs is not the answer. There needs to be a sort of a version of economics where people can think about different economic systems um, that are still incentive compatible, but don't work by command and control. Um, and that seems to me the fundamental thing that we've got to do here. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a, you know, a raving anarchist uh, by nature, but uh, I don't see how the current economic system is going to work when, uh, when capital can use AI to replace labor almost completely. Before I turn to you, there's one idea that often comes on that topic is to put a tax on robots or AI. Even Bill Gates, Sam Altman have yeah. brought this idea or defended this idea. I would like to hear what you think about this. Well, if it's, it's, it's only a, possible. It's, it's a way of funding um, UBI, right? But ultimately, it's not going to keep people in work, right? I mean, another another variant of that is simply to say, for these professions, you're not allowed to use robots, right? And in fact, politicians are already carving out a space for themselves, saying, uh, for example, in California, uh, a machine is not allowed to impersonate a human being for the purpose of convincing somebody to vote in a particular direction, right? So they're already carving out a no-bot space for being a politician. Uh, and, you know, that it's, I guess, predictable. Um, but that's another way of doing things. But it just seems to me that this is, uh, you know, putting your finger in the dike, right? It's King Canute saying to the tide, you know, don't come in, right? And ultimately the tide comes in. Mela, where would you start? So I, I, will, I will take your question seriously. So if I was uh, the, the president of, of the most powerful state, which I'm, you know, uh, it was a joke, but nevertheless, it's an interesting joke, which is the most powerful state today? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, I think that, and, and this actually resonates with, with what Sriota says uh, said, but I, the, the first thing I would start working working on is create an alliance at the level of, um, at, as large as possible alliance at the global level to, to move uh, the, um, um, to move from GDP to beyond and to another way of measuring uh, value creation uh, at the level of the country, which, you know, we're going to the incentive dimension, because if you do that, and you, if you have a composite index, uh, you are starting to measure things like uh, pollution, destruction of biodiversity, and you're starting to cost to, 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 to put a price on those, uh, they have to be included in, you know, at all levels of the economic chain, uh, they have to be included in all the incentive system that are at the level of firms, at the level of uh, um, you know, um, cities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so you actually generate a, a kind of downward mechanism where you start changing, yes, the incentives, but behind changing the incentive, what you're changing is the value system. 
uh, which is what uh, Stuart was saying, that in fact, what we are, are in need of change is a, a paradigm, is a paradigm change. We need to, to really change what we value. You know, we saw that during, uh, uh, during the COVID, we saw some, some kind of realization that maybe those jobs, you know, the health jobs, uh, people who were on the front line of the health sector or people who were kind of delivering us the food or, or et cetera, were in fact, maybe more valuable than um, investment finance, you know, or, or you know, okay, I shouldn't use this example in Geneva, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so how do we revalue our, our system as a whole? Uh, I think it has to, it, it, it should start well, it should not start, but it should happen also at the top. Very, very true. And it's a very simple thing to do, huh? to move from GDP to uh, uh, an integrated index. There are many that exist already. There are quite a number of exercises that have been done to produce them. So in a sense, it's, it's not a crazy idea. It just takes for political courage and it takes a collective because you cannot do that. We've seen this in a single country. There are limits to that. We saw that with New Zealand. We saw that with Finland. There was limits to, to the capacity of a politician to do that in a single country. But the second thing I would add is um, I would also add that this cannot only happen at that level. It's also our, all, uh, you know, our responsibility wherever we are in terms of uh, our, 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 you know, institutional leverage point. Where you know, if we are heads of a university, if we are head of a firm, if we, etc., to actually act upon what we can do at that level. Uh, and for that, there, there's really uh, a need to communicate, a need to educate, uh, so that actually uh, I see this in our generation of students now. It's a much more, uh, in a sense, uh, natural way of looking at the world than 10 years ago. Uh, so we have to build on that so that the next generation is pushing this everywhere uh, in the different shops that they will occupy so that there's also a trickle, a, a trickle up mechanism um and and a kind of uh, you know a, a, a mass movement in a sense in that direction thank you very much so we have a, a few minutes left uh, sorry for being so so long from all of us uh, are there questions in the audience yes please do please push the button so that we hear you oh. hi i wanted to ask you do you think also that ai could be an opportunity for this change of paradigm because uh, we've been using AI for the system that we know, so supporting an increase in productivity, but actually can also be an opportunity because in fact, AI um, can be used to work towards all the objectives of the United Nations. So, and if so, how, where would you start? Because I think we have to start bottom up with lots of sp specific projects that we can then escalate, but I wanted to know your views on this. I can, I can, yeah. I can start totally. I mean, you know, all technologies have always been that way. Uh, I think the first technology of humanity is the fire. The fire is an amazing uh, technology with a lot of positives in it. And it, it's also a very destructive technology. So all technologies are like that. So AI is the same, maybe, you know, even more powerful uh, to be discussed, but so it can be used for good and it can be, be used for less good depending on the system in which it inscribes itself uh, definitely but I, I think we need also to go beyond the AI for good uh, or tech for good in general we ha you have to go towards what I like to call the the good in AI so we have to go towards actually the development of technologies that are by design taking in this new paradigm and that's where I think I feel that education, I think that education is really key. The transformation of, of the education of generations of uh, AI producers is really key. So, uh, but, but it's not enough either, because obviously as long as the system uh, uh, of, of the firms that are making you know, huge um, money from, from uh, using AI in this way is not changed, it's not gonna be enough. There's maybe a follow-up question online. And it asks very concretely about the skills and competencies required to, to build on, on this potential of uh, 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 AI coming in. So what do we have to learn to build uh, on, on the new uh, opportunities that AI offers? Um, so I, I agree with Mary Lord. I think uh, the application of AI in education is a huge opportunity. Um, you know, our education system hasn't really changed in two and a half thousand years. Uh, it's still somebody standing up 
here and talking to somebody sitting down there and maybe writing on used to be chalk now we have whiteboards and so on but that's you know it's really hasn't changed very much and um you know i i think if you offered uh you know the, the, there's a big question about teachers teachers are naturally very resistant to the idea that ai is going to deliver all the education um but i actually think um that if you made the following deal right if, if i'm if i'm a government and the education profession says, okay, with AI, we can deliver twice as good, I mean, quantitatively twice as good an education to everybody. Meaning that, you know, many children would reach college level by the age of 11 or 12. Um, would you be willing to fund more teachers so that we would run small study groups of, you know, eight to 10 kids you know, and we would work with them individually and, and with their AI tutors. Uh, I think that's a deal that most governments would take. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't think that teachers need to fear this technology as long as we find ways to use it that are not strictly just replacing teachers and leaving students un, unguided by humans, which I don't think is a, a good thing. Right yeah, I would like to, to get, go back to the question and say, you know, talk about what what competences um, uh, do do we need uh, to to push to push the thing in on the right direction, in the right direction rather than in the negative. So clearly, it's very simple for me. Uh, three one, three top ones: critical thinking and critical thinking and critical thinking and critical thinking, uh, creativity and creativity and creativity and creativity and a, a sense of belonging to a, a, a you know the only planet that we have so this this sense of being integrated into a whole and into you know uh, generations after generation which implies actually a sense of the collective where we've been pushing a lot the sense of the individual over the last hundred years so this is for me the three skills that we have to deploy at all levels of the education uh, system uh, this is, you know, those are actually definitely skills that we are putting on our agenda at the Institute, but I think it has to start very, very young to, to develop those, those uh, competences. We have five minutes left, let's say. We have two questions, one here and one here at the end. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I'm more optimistic about the AI and the future of AI. However, uh, why the focus when you, what I'm listening, I see the focus on the economy. And let's say if the AI succeed to help us to with the humanity to increase the humanity uh, achieving our goals, how would we ensure that the AI systems, when they take over, they are fair enough? I'm talking about responsible AI and fairness in AI, because humanity failed for decades when it comes to inclusion, diversity, um, women, black people, LGBT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So within the AI, with the black box we have inside of it, how, what are the efforts they should be in place to ensure that if we succeed with the AI, the AI systems will be fair enough for everyone? Stuart? Uh, so I, I think this is a really important question. Um, and I think it is appreciated. If you look at the European Union AI Act, for example, about 35 of the clauses in the act talk about the need for fairness, the need to make sure that data sets are representative, uh, that the process is accessible, uh, and so on. So I, I think the message is heard. Um, and there is an active research community in AI uh, that works on these questions. There is more work to do. Um, and notions of fairness and representativeness in, in data, for example, are not uh, agreed. Right. There are multiple different definitions of fairness. There isn't a definition of what is a representative data set. Um, no one can give you an answer on what that means, but it's in the act. So people are going to have to figure this out pretty quickly. You know, by the end of this year, uh, you're going to be required to have representative data sets. So we better figure out what that means. Um, you know, I, I, there are clearly examples where AI systems because they are trained on historical data sets that reflect biases in society, reproduce or amplify those biases. But you know, we also have experience, for example, in lending, 
where lending used to be the province of the bank manager who could be as biased as they wanted and no one would be able to point to any uh, direct evidence of that. And in fact, I would say the introduction of machine learning for lending, which goes back to the 1960s uh, and legislation requiring that those algorithms be transparent uh, and uh, fair in a particular sense that's written in the law. Uh, I think that's improved uh, the situation considerably. So it, it, it is the case that when you have AI systems whose operations you can understand um, or whose properties you can measure, uh, then you can actually improve the situation. But thank you for the question. I think it's a really important one. Yeah, indeed, it's a very important one. I just had a, a very small point, which is, uh, you know, this good connects back to what I was saying, that we have to go beyond tech for or, or AI for good to, towards actually good in AI. It means the good in AI includes uh, inclusion uh, by design. Uh, and this is where we really have to, to really take a big step. I think we are very far from that. Uh, we, we have to take a big step in the way in which we train, in the, in the regulations, in the governance of the way in which AI is produced. And transparency is a big factor, obviously, here. Uh, and obviously, this will not work if we are not imposing that at the broader level of our economy in general. So it has to also uh, you know, uh, be uh, a very strong uh, transformation of our economic system in general. We'll take the last question here, please. Um, and so I just wanted to ask about the certainty that the economy and future of work is basically going to be jobless as we look at, at the way AI could advance. Because if you look at, for example, the World Wide Web data and smartphones, the strange intersection led to this entire new world called the creator economy. But nobody could have foreseen that at the end of the 80s, early 90s. So how do we know for certain um, the new areas to be discovered will automatically be something that's going to be automated because doesn't it assume humans stay the same? And when you look at things like synthetic biology, brain computer interfaces, how are we so certain that it's going to be a jobless future? Where do we stand on the curve? On the bell curve? Because it could be another shape, right? Or do you still believe it's uh, the best curve that there is? Yeah, I mean, there are some like Elon Musk who say, yeah, we'll just connect our brains up to computers and that way we can stay ahead. Um, the idea that everybody has to have brain surgery just in order to survive uh, is a little bit disconcerting to me. It suggests that we probably made a mistake somewhere along the line. Um, so, you know, I, I think that one thing about AI viewed from 10,000 feet, it gives human, the human race a choice, right? Roughly speaking, up to now, we haven't had a choice because it's you do this or you die, right? You work, you scrabble, you plant, you reap, you do these things or you die. Um, and a lot of war has been about, you know, we're not doing too well at not dying, yeah. so we're going to go and take what, what you have. Um, so if AI can basically decouple the human race from this, this imperative, uh, we have a choice about what the future should be like. So we should, this is what we're doing here, right? Envision that future and work towards it. And I don't think we should accept as inevitable that AI will replace all work. It's just that in the current system, mm -hmm. that seems to be the way things are going. And even in the creator economy, which is actually not that big. I think the number of influencers who make a living is <laughs> is not very big. Um, you know, the number of novelists who make a living is is you know only a few hundred. Um, you know, and that's the creator economy that's been around for centuries. Um, so, uh, I, I don't think we can rely on humans staying ahead of AI systems in remunerated work. Uh, to uh, to give us a sense of of comfort from this, um, and as I say, I'm not a big fan of brain surgery <laughs> as a sort of requirement. Yeah, can I, can I just finish on yeah. this because I think it's a very important question too. 
I, if you remember what I said is definitely that the long term, I don't know, and nobody knows, you know, in the long term, I don't know, and nobody knows. I think what we can project is the medium to short term, if nothing changes, the short to medium term, if we don't change uh, the underlying uh, regime, in fact, uh, that that's pretty, I, I would, I would be quite, you know, uh, quite sure about the fact that we are going to see huge amounts of uh, job replacement if we are not moving deeply on the structure of the system uh, in, in, in the current conditions. Well, still, I'd like to end up this, this first panel on a more positive note, right? And ask you maybe the question that is in the, in the program, and which is, how can we help people imagine a more positive future of work with AI? You, you gave us three hints, the three C's, if I call it well, community, creativity, and critical thinking. Maybe you have something to add up, but maybe start with you. How to come up with a more positive view of, of what has been discussed in the last hour? Or what to bring to people so that they have this more positive view? Well, so I, I think this interpersonal world that, uh, that I mentioned um, could actually be a pretty wonderful place, right? Um, people would still have jobs. They would still feel the need to become educated. I think that we probably need a cultural shift as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just as ancient Sparta created a culture where military prowess was sine qua non of being a human being, uh, we could create a culture where uh, general either intellectual or physical creative uh, capabilities would just be seen as, well, if you don't have those, you're not, you're not really uh, making it as a human being. And, and so this cultural pressure can have a huge impact. Um, and it, you know, it's part of the incentive structure that we all work with, but it's a part of the incentive structure that isn't economically visible. Um, so I, I actually think it could be uh, a pretty wonderful world in the sense that these roles would draw on the full potential of human beings, right? What it means to be a human being in a way that screwing the tops on toothpaste tubes does not. <laughs> Yeah. Last word for you, Marila, if you want. Yeah, no, de definitely. So I think indeed developing those competences at our individual levels, critical thinking, creativity. I like your summary of the last one, community, because I think this is indeed the, you know, you have a good summary of what it takes to be human, I think, with, with those three uh, uh three um uh, three words um and and you know the the um affirmation of agency but the affirmation of uh, our agency as collectives because we're not going to do that alone okay but we still can do things and we certainly can do things if we collaborate and if we work together uh, in in the direction and then the third point that I would like to put also on the table is the re-evaluation of success and again I talked about COVID and, and about you know this slight period where we change a bit the scale of what is valuable in our society you know what what is actually a valuable job what is a, I think that we have to re-evaluate the way we define success at all levels uh, and and uh, in, indeed move to a redefinition of, uh, of uh, success that goes less towards having and more towards being as I was saying before. Thank you very much. I asked this question because I think it might be the red thread to the next uh, uh, part of the, the afternoon, the breakout session. Uh, we'll hear more about this after the break. But before that, again, I'll ask for a round of applause for our two guests. Thank you very much. We're going to kickstart the second part uh, of the afternoon where now that you have a sense of setting the stage on the future of work, possibilities, fears, opportunities, uh, as we discussed before, we try to imagine, as someone suggested, we don't know, right, what's going to happen. Someone mentioned about creative community that didn't know about 10 years ago. We don't know what the future holds. So how can we imagine that future differently? We did a quick um, competition locally with the help of Task Platform and the Graduate Institute, uh, run for a few weeks only, but we got a number of submissions and we selected four of them to show you. And the question was, how do you imagine the future work when there is AI around us? And that question can be answered in so many different ways, but I'm gonna show you four samples of what students and others did. And that could be probably the first stage of our exercise. So let's go and look at them. 
Oh, to listen to the sound, you have to put your. Can I share a little detail? Yeah, please. Uh, so we um, we ran this competition launched at the Task Platform's Future of Work Summit, which happened here in Geneva uh, around three weeks ago. Um, we launched the competition one week before to give it a bit of a warm up. So there's been about a, a month of people to work on their submissions and and send them in. So this is separate from what we're going to do, um, but. There are some uh, some strengths and some limitations of the submissions that we saw in light of the the big picture that we want to achieve through the our future life challenge. Um, so I think these are a starting point and a testing ground for us in terms of refining how we ask the question. Um, when we ask people to imagine the future, what kind of prompts we give, what kind of incentives we bring, as uh, Stuart said, we're we're all about. Uh, the incentives for, for creativity, the incentives for thinking about the future and how to get away from those dystopian visions of the future. So we asked people explicitly, um, being that we were going to speak at the AI for Good Summit, I think the final competition will be broader topics, but we asked people to imagine a, a future of work uh, with artificial intelligence, both uh, that the future will have ubiquitous AI around us, but also using AI tools to create these short movies. Uh, so it's been a really fascinating experiment of, uh, of the participants submitting uh, their experiences of working with AI to create these AI to create these films. And to add to that, we didn't ask filmmakers to do this. We asked the everyday person to come up with an idea and try to portray that with the existing tools just to make it easier for them. I think even beyond the everyday person, we're we're hosting the Graduate Institute in uh, in International Geneva, so it's really like policymakers and academics is our audience, <laughs> students. Um, so so we're coming from from that perspective. Um, so we can jump right in. The first film that we're going to show the the filmmaker is actually in the audience here, Jan Mathieu Donier. Um, who, uh, who works with AI on a, on a daily basis uh, and who actually helped us think a little around how to use these tools as well. So over to, I won't explain too much about the films themselves. I'll leave you to have your own perspectives and, and takeaways and we can discuss afterwards. So the first. Do you need this? Yeah, you need this for the sound. Virtual reality, metaverse, augmented reality, blockchain, and cryptocurrencies or yeah. artificial intelligence. All these technologies are setting the stage for our future. Unfortunately, these are often wrapped in misconception and outdated stereotypes. They will definitely transform our ways of life in many aspects, and it is our common duty to harness their power and use these as positive enablers. As the voice of the future generation, here is my message. We'll be using technology at all levels, enhancing every aspect of our lives. It will help us reduce our global carbon footprint, connecting us from distant corners of our planet without the need for fossil fuel powered travel. Transportation will be safer and more green. Agriculture will be more efficient in all parts of the world. Industrial processes will be reinvented. Dangerous tasks will no longer be done by humans. Our workplaces will be safer and more enjoyable. Medicine will be redefined and expanded. Technology will allow millions of doctors to treat billions of patients worldwide through shared knowledge. People in remote areas will finally get access to quality diagnostic and care. Many, many lives will be saved. It might take a generation to fully realize, but we will get there. And when we do, it will be for the better, connecting humanity in a new way, enabling humans to focus on what makes us unique. Be a positive actor of change, harness the power of technologies for work, for life, and for brighter tomorrows, for us and for the future generations. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? The future is now. Mm -hmm. 
this one. Yes, so this is the first, it's by uh, Jan Mathieu Donier, it's called Crafting Better Tomorrows, um, and I think each of you have a, a little handout which has the synopsis of these videos in the words of their, their creators. Um, so Jan Mathieu says, uh, Crafting Better Tomorrows is the title of his videos, he believes it's a matter of dedication, care and vision. Tech by itself may not change the world for the better, but, uh, but tran uh, technological means with human vision and goodwill had the power to transform the world for the better. So catching on some of the themes that we discussed earlier. The, uh, the next video that we'll show is called Workvolution. It's uh, Workvolution Shaping a Better Tomorrow by Nguyen Tat. <laughs> Sorry. In a world filled with endless possibilities, the future of work holds the key to a better tomorrow. Technology is advancing at an unprecedented pace, transforming the way we work, live, and connect. Collaboration and creativity are becoming the cornerstones of success, as the boundaries between disciplines blur. Virtual and augmented reality are revolutionizing industries, providing immersive experiences and unlocking new frontiers. The future of work is not only about technology, but also about sustainability and responsible practices. As automation takes over mundane tasks, humans are free to focus on what truly matters, making a positive impact on society. The future of work is inclusive, embracing diversity, and valuing the unique perspectives each individual brings. The future of work is a canvas waiting to be painted, where passion, innovation, and collaboration weave the fabric of progress. Together, we can shape a better tomorrow through the power of workvolution. So uh, set in a, a futuristic backdrop, the film explores how technology, collaboration, and sustainability are shaping a, a better tomorrow. Uh, a nice uh, pitch for the future of work, I think. The, uh, the next video is a, a shorter, snappier one. It takes us into a particular sector. It's called The Future of Construction, The Augmented Revolution by Si Hui Wu. Um, and she asked ChatGPT and Midjourney to provide her with prompts for what the future of the construction industry, which she works within, could look like. transfer limitations. <laughs> So basically the, sorry about not being able to see it as well as we'd hoped, the future of construction we, will be sustainable, safe, inclusive, and collaborative. Um, and on your sheets, uh, Sihui really lays out the steps that she went through and uh, how together with ChatGPT, she described uh, that vision of the future. So there's there's much more in the uh, in the text than actually in the video as well. What we liked was the the images behind it too, laying out what that future could look like. Um, and then finally, an honorable mention, which takes a, a slightly different approach. <laughs> um, shot at the Future of Work Summit itself. <laughs> Here we go. 
Breaking news. The future of work is here. Here's what to expect. Thank you, John. It's time for the meeting. Thank you. Appreciate the reminder. What time is it? Hi, sorry for being late. Hey, thanks for reminding me. Great. How are you guys doing? We. Um, so I, I'm going to save the discussion on these for the tables and for after the breakout sessions, just because we're we're running a little behind on time. Um, from from our side, this experience of uh, launching the competition, uh, receiving the films, going through them, we thought a little bit about what what we saw, what was in there, which is much of what Stuart and and Mary Law spoke about around a real. Um, around what we want to see in the future of work, more inclusion and more human-centered future of work. But what we missed a little in those films, we think down to the use of AI in generating them, is real moments from the future to bring that to life. So we get the headlines from the future, but we don't see what you would imagine in a, in a clip, like how this would look and feel. Um, what we would really be doing as people in this future, where we would be, what the differences in, in texture would be depending on, on location or occupation. Um, so that's what we're hoping to try and get into a little today. We saw, we hardly saw individuals apart from um, in that final clip, which is why we, we gave it that honorable mention where you see technology from the, the outside looking at the people using it, which is, which is quite nice. Um, and seeing like how their interactions are together with that technology. So the aim of the breakout session that we're going into now is uh, for you to create your own visions of the future. We'll split you into, into four groups. Um, and within each of your groups, you have a, a, a helpful moderator from our team to guide you through the, the exercise a little. Uh, we'll give you hints from the from the stage as well. And, um, and uh, one of my team who has their computer with uh, AI tools loaded up on it. So we can use ChatGPT uh, for the creation of scripts, texts, and ideas. Uh, we can use MidJourney for the creation of images and then tie those together in a very simple way using, using Canva. So have the experience of using our own imagination and uh, augmenting that uh, with, with AI as a, a partner, think of them as a brainstorming partner at the, the table. Um, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Yasmin, who's been uh, working on, on the competition itself and the processes we go through uh, to, to take you through the, the steps of the breakout. Yasmin, if that's okay, she's... She's sitting down here. Hi, everyone. So basically, we're going to literally test the skills of critical thinking, creativity, and connectivity. But before we do that, everyone or every other person has a bunch of post-it notes and a pen. Um, if you could take a minute to close your eyes in real time right now. Close your eyes. Seriously, close your eyes. It's going to take 30 seconds, but please make me happy. And um, if we say the word, Imagine the future of work. What are the images that are coming right now to you? Just take a couple of seconds. With all that we discussed, what are the three, four images? And whenever you're ready, jot those words on your paper. So now I'm hearing pens and post-it notes. Uh, we will ask every two rows to face each other. And it will be about building and engaging the scenarios. 
So what we're asking is literally have a bit of a talk with each other about what is the vision of the future of work that you have in mind and build a short scenario, anything you want, and maybe use chat GPT. So you have Joanita, Michelle, uh, Paula, and myself. We have our computers feed us in our scenarios and tell us what you want to do. And uh, then we will create the, the images all together as well. Just wanted to add a note for our watchers online who we almost forgot about sorry sorry zoom viewers um on the chat i believe we have posted the uh, instructions and the steps that we'll walk through for this breakout session so while you can't participate here in the room for us um over the next hour please feel free to walk through those steps think through the process uh try out the the ai tools described there we've given you some instructions as well uh, and if you if you do come up with a, a movie or images at the end, then you can upload them to via the the Zoom chat as well, and we can include them in the discussion. And of course, add your comments um, and questions and input to the conversation at the end as well. Um, otherwise, do a quick brainstorm and and come back and join us in an hour <laughs> after the breakout sessions are are finished. Thank you so much. Um, a, a little introduction on the room setting so what we'll ask you to do is the people in the front row and the people in the third row just swizzle backwards to create four groups um, and at each of those groups you have you have two facilitators you have a, a lovely lady from uh, my team Yasmin uh, Paula at the end there uh, Michelle here in the middle and Juanita uh, at the back table and you also have uh, somebody from the, the Our Future Life Collective. So over here you have Nishan, who will be facilitating the table. You have Meilin with Ranita at the back. You have uh, Diana at the uh, corner table over here. And, uh, and Jerome at the, the front set of, of tables here. Um, the, the front set of tables also has Zen Mathieu as an extra hand there with experience in, in AI and film creation. And, uh, and we will come down and join you. So with that, uh, I think we can change our slides to the next slide, please, thank you. And uh, yeah, Yasmin and I will, will tag team and talk you through the steps. So the, the first step of the activity is to start brainstorming your, your short film. So think about the theme, the narrative, the angle, share what you jotted down on your little post-its about what you imagine the future of work to look like. And there's some prompts here that can help you. Uh, you're already off, on you go. <laughs> Hello, welcome back everyone. Welcome back everyone online as well. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing the, the results of the conversation. Um, Juanita is figuring out how to get our pictures up onto the screen. Um, and we can go table by table to, uh, to discuss, or group by group, uh, to discuss your, your images and what you spoke about. Did anyone um, not make it to an image and just ended up with scripts? Well, perfect, then we can start with you. <laughs> Hi, so I was not expecting to be the reporter, but hi, let me sit down. So our group had a very interesting conversation about what future of work means and starting talking about the accessibility of basic universal income and having very polarizing views of what kind of future of work it leads to. Um, we tried to feed a few scenarios into chat GPT with different characters. We did all agree though to, an, to a city, an environment where it's about green vertical city and a symbiosis between nature and a high tech where technology could help human beings in a sense, not work at all. Um, all the scenarios we got, and I'm not going to read through the scenarios because they're a long conversation, the first one started with Leo, who basically loves farming and technology, and he's developing great stuff about how to harvest food for an entire community. Chad GPT felt very focused about having a community all together. We tried to run the same thing because one of our colleagues here was like, but 
what does it mean to work? Maybe we don't want to work. Maybe we don't want to learn. Um, what's an idea? What, why do we have to work in the future? And for some reason, Chat GPT envisioned all the time any persona, whether 30 or no age or no gender, as someone who can devote time to their passion and health, volunteer, always for a community. And the more we're trying to refine these scenarios and having these two people dialogue with each other, they sounded more and more dull. Uh, I will give you an example very quickly and then I'll, and I'll conclude on that one. It was uh, Leo saying, hi Mia, how's the planning for the block party going? Hey Leo, it's great. We've got some fantastic local bands, some food stalls. How about you? Yes, it's progressing really well. It, it was completely devoid of any, any dimension. Although beforehand they had full lives but they had no work, so they had no... They had no jobs. jobs. They didn't have work. They, they had no jobs. So that's where we were at because we were really thinking about do we need to have work in the next 100 years or not? And what can ChatGPT give us an answer to that? Thank you so much. Um, maybe we go... Yeah, to, yeah, we can, well, we had two different um, images from that group. So we could start with, uh, Paola, do you want to describe the, the one that you ended up with? Yeah. Or the, uh, the inspiration behind the, the, the woman who inspired the image could explain. Actually, um, it is called, the heading is um, collabor virtual collaborative work. Uh, and um, the, the 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 thing on the head of the. I'm sorry. One correction. Um, it is called uh, the holodeck as future work ground. This is uh, the, the the title. Yeah, it's a bit different. And the the things on the head of the person are removable. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, actually, it is about how to collaborate with other people in uh, a creative uh, way and uh, while uh, thinking uh, at a poem and um, like uh, imagine music in images because the people are surrounded, surrounded by music and poems. Yeah. <laughs> um, shall we do the, the the next one in that group, which is the uh, picture of yes. this one? Yes. Exactly. Would one of you like to? Looking for my one. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> took us a while to get this image the way that we wanted to get it. But um, more or less what we're trying to illustrate here is a future of work where medical practitioners get more patient time uh, because mundane tasks like, for example, blood drawing or um, labs, labs exactly, um, are essentially occupied or performed by an autonomous AI. So the physician, as you see in the picture there, is able to spend more time uh, creating trust and enhancing the personal relationship with the patient, um, as opposed to having to devote this time to tasks that actually detract from the human element of medicine. Very short summary of a huge discussion, which could have generated around six different movies. Um, and we go along that table uh, to... Okay, so we'll go we'll go around then. Okay, we'll uh, go maybe down down here. Yeah. Which one do I do first? Because I need to figure out. Do I do this one first? Yeah, whichever is easier. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, you can describe. Is it better to show first than describe, or describe first than show? Okay. 
this block? Where does it come from? It comes from Zoom. Mm. And then they go. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually really good, but I have different ideas than what else. Ooh, what's that? That's the idea of a nightmare in the future, and then she's waking up from the nightmare. And then we try to imagine the perfect workplace, which would be very collaborative, green, and a, a place where uh, people would communicate with each other face to face. And sit in air on chairs. <laughs> well done on making it to a video. Mm -hmm. So briefly, I will explain our very many ideas. We had a tough time um, selecting one conversation, but what we wanted to represent was the idea of um, um, a, a virtual metaverse conversation from two people in remote areas from the global south. So I'm, I'm going to have to skip things because we didn't make it to... Um, so the virtual VR conversation was this one, the first image that we generated to represent that. They're all you're using their, oh, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> While she's doing that, I just wanted to say the conversation was so rich. I was so blown away by our group. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so the first thing that we want to show is that we wanted these people to be in the metaverse like five, 25 years from now, people are using going to work in their kind of metaverse uh, uh, VR headsets. And then they, they are from the global south because we wanted to make sure we integrated people of different kind of um, ethnicities, not just always the same people from the Western world. And what they're doing is having a conversation about how, let's say, um, elder care has changed and also um, child care has changed with the coming of AI and giving more possibilities when it comes to um, a tailored, uh, tailored, compassionate care. And so that was something that was, we fought very strongly. So we prompted something, but I think that they haven't seen it yet. So I'm just searching for it because this is the first time the rest of... Um... So I'd like to mm -hmm. just uh, jump in here. We had a meta conversation about what we did and Ibrahim from mm -hmm. Syria actually would like to invite him to say a few words about what he thought we should be telling our AIs and how we should train our AIs. Go ahead. There were so many interesting ideas. The first one, I would say, the idea of uh, not just having uh, AI assistant, but having the AI guard, which means from our uh, friend here, which means every person owns his own data, is not just the big companies owning the data. This is one of the ideas. The other thing, all of us, we agreed on uh, child and uh, elder care, not to give any of these, not any of the jobs, but still we need the human touch there, not to automate these certain jobs, let's say. So we, we didn't see the future with full automation of uh, AI doing teaching or doing like uh, elder care, this is one. And one of the things we, this is not in the future, we see it, we hope to see this now, that the development of AI to have a very uh, diverse inclusion, uh, technical people developing this AI because the developer will uh, mirror the, the program. So the more we are diverse in the technicalities in uh, our AI workshops in the future, the more our AI will be responsible AI, let's say in terms of fairness, uh, ethics, uh, data privacy, because we not one group of people will have the, the truth, let's say. So to sum up. Well you. said, thank you. We zoomed in on a particular job, so a psychologist, and and this could be as maybe soon as 15 years, but up until 2050 is what we prompted it. Um, and what would psychology look like then? We did agree that a lot of therapy will be largely aut automated, um, and most of us will have kind of personalized therapists, but with the advances in technology, understanding deeper traumas uh, and really being able to look inward could be going to a therapist's office um, and using an fMRI machine uh, to be able to surface different memories and really get to visually get to the to the memories that are causing the trouble, and then using augmented reality in the room 
guided by a psychologist to take you through that memory, walk you through and help you perceive it differently um, or to kind of reinstall it in a way that could unravel and undo some of that trauma. Um, and so where we actually interestingly found challenges is with our actual AI's imagination. AI continued to want to paint this in what looks like a dystopian setting versus we saw this as using science to better understand the human, but you couldn't actually, it didn't have that optimistic twist to the actual coloring of it. And I think that's just a reflection of how humans view AI uh, and what we share about it. I want to jump in on that. So I haven't spoken to all of you yet, but um, I co-founded the People's Internet with Vince Cerf, the father of the internet. And um, this idea of thinking 50 years into the future is inspired because in 2024, the internet will be 50 years old. So imagine 50 years ago, what would people have thought about what we'd have by today? And now today, what will we have in 50 years? And so Amir had this amazing idea to say, let's, there's no one brilliant person in the world that's going to be able to tell us, but collectively, we might come up with some good ideas. And what was interesting to me, what I learned today is it has to be iterative. You have to do it and you have to do it and you have to do it. You have to hear from everybody else and think, okay, now I know how to do the next one. And so that's what I've learned today from, from this process. Anyone else comment on what they've heard or seen? Diane? So I, I'm gonna jump off on, on that last point of it becoming an iterative process or a practice to envision our future life, to envision the future of work in an AI-driven or otherwise driven future, driven, driven world. Um, and what's so uh, challenging and inspiring about that iterative process is that it calls on all of us. It's not just um, one visionary, as, as was said, it is a collective practice. And so I think in uh, the challenges that, that my group had, and that I think we all have in articulating what that looks like, we are bumping up against the, the experience of not being iterative, but being uh, uh, a, a static uh, in our achievement-oriented work. So when we were talking earlier about some of the shifts that need to happen to support a, a, a vision of, of the future of work, we talked about a shift in the future of economics, a shift in the future of finance, and how we think about work itself not just a future version of what work is now. And this is a shift from an extractive system to a regenerative system or an iterative system that's less about a binary zero sum win, winner uh, focused competition. And it's more about a collaborative fluid practice. And if we think about work less as a, uh, an attempt to contain, control, and conquer something uh, with one end result and the currency-based rewards of money as we now understand it, that we're dependent on for our basic needs and beyond, and instead think about work as a practice, an iterative practice of uh, engaging and empathizing and co-creating to generate and base uh, our, our value generation on a new kind of currency, currency as, as fuel, as energy. That's, that's a really different scenario. And it's hard for us to put ourselves there and to see it. And that's part of what I, I learned and saw from this exercise that we need to train ourselves in those core competencies of empathy, critical problem solving, and creativity that are perhaps our birthright as human species, 
and that gets stamped out of us with the current system. So as we shift that system, we're gonna be able to see more clearly the, uh, uh, the vision of, of our future work. And that's what I, I learned today. Thank you very much. Gentlemen. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, based on what has been said already, um, I wanted to maybe um, say a few words about agency and so something that um, Stuart mentioned a couple of times um, in his um, speech this morning or early on today, talking about uh, technology complementing or substituting uh, human beings. Uh, Marie-Laure mentioning, let's regain agency. Uh, and I also really liked very much this idea of we cannot um, transition to something if we don't know where we're transitioning to. Uh, and what I what I realized today in, in this exercise and also in the exercise that we do with youth uh, in Switzerland um, in, in a similar format um, is the challenge is to challenge our assumptions. It's very difficult to challenge our assumptions and it's something that we experienced um, ourselves as well. Or I personally experienced myself in this group. Uh, we were trying to think about a moment uh, uh, in a day uh, in 2050, 2030. Um, and we started saying, okay, we wake up in the morning, we have a cup of coffee, we go to work. How is this changing? But actually uh, our assumptions um, should be challenged. Um, and it, this is something that is very difficult to do. And, and in a way we have, we're, we're not really good at this. So how do, we, how do we challenge these assumptions and kids are better at this um, than us? So in a way, what I would, what, what I would invite myself to, to do or in us is to become again, a little bit kind of childish in a way and manage uh, to challenge our assumptions um, about the present and um, the future. And there are many, many uh, assumptions that we don't even, uh, we're not even aware of this. And the two questions that I have is, um, you know, who is invited in uh, exploring the future? We are here, uh, most of us, if not all of us have a university degree. Uh, you know, we may be culturally diverse, but we often have a very similar social economic background. Um, there are lots of kids out there, uh, teenagers, um, who do not have this opportunity to actually come to the conversation um, and, and explore the future. So how do we take them into the conversation? And there was one group that mentioned the Global South, evidently, but it's not only, uh, you know, the Global South, it's also the elderly who have something to say. Uh, so the, the different uh, people invited in the conversation and as, uh, you know, uh, the Geneva Great Institute, Global Governance, of course, I'm thinking of then how do we translate these ideas into policy? Um, and how do we make sure that actually it becomes something? Because if it just stays here among us, it's fun, it's nice, but it needs to become something very concrete. And that's very difficult to do because it's a clash of worlds. It's a clash of a world of creativity and a world of regulation. Uh, and as probably many of you have already experienced when you do transdisciplinary work, it's a challenge. It's very difficult. We speak different languages. Uh, we have, we were trained in a very different way. We, we have, we work with uh, computer scientists and we can experience this social scientists, computer scientists, they don't really communicate well together. Uh, so how do we do this? Um, and here for both, how do we translate or bridge this gap between you know, creativity, foresight, participatory methods, and policy world, maybe AI can help. Um, and, and so that would be my take for, uh, for today. Thank you very much. Thanks I'm well. going to jump back in about the AI can help. So um, this question about how to translate between these discussions and the policy world. So we at the People Centered Internet we have written policy documents for the German G7 about how small medium enterprises should be financed so that any company anywhere, we shouldn't rely on innovation only happening by large companies. So that in fact, if we do this, we talked earlier about the incentives, why should we think about the future? 
imagine if this incentive for doing for thinking about the future is that you could start a company to make that future come real that you could do one of the ideas that you are coming up with it's not out of the realm of possibility this has been suggested to the german g7 giz is working with us to try this out in three african countries this is starting to happen it's a very early stage uh, the u.s department of commerce is working with us in puerto rico to look at how new ways of looking at sme small medium enterprise financing could be a source of job creation could restart the creative economy could challenge us about how digital assets the way they're structured now do not support writers musicians how should we be structuring the institutional frameworks and digital assets of the future so that we can encourage new creative industries all of this is starting to happen now and it's a very exciting time but it is also frightening <laughs> and so don't be afraid we've got each other we will learn together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to hear from you, Stuart. And I, I, I like the idea that maybe, maybe I, I wasn't in the group, so I, I can say what I haven't heard, but maybe it was difficult for you to step out of your preconceived idea on, on, on what an, a future of work would look like with AI. Why couldn't AI help in, in that sense? Because AI is in a sense unpredictable and can you know uh, uh, do or, or say or imagine things that we we couldn't could we use ai to help us predict this, uh, this world of uh, work tomorrow with ai outside of our preconceived ideas i mean it, yeah so in principle with better ai than we had right i mean i'm, I'm a little bit worried about the sort of the the general tendency for every conversation about a hard problem to end with, but when we have AI, it'll solve it for us, right? And, and certainly the AI that we have is much more duplicative than it is really generative. Um, and I think some of the questions that we're talking about today are some of the hardest questions um, that our society is grappling with. And they, they require a real understanding of what it's like to be a human. What you know? What does it mean to get out of bed in the morning? What is that like? You know, I, a, a nice thing I did learn from an economist is that economics is about why people get out of bed. Right? That's what it's about. It's not about money. It's not about finance or GDP or anything. Else. It's about why do people get out of bed? And how do we organize things so that they do get out of bed? Right? Uh, I think that's a very nice viewpoint. But until you're a human and you've sort of been there, I don't think you're going to be good at visualizing. I mean, you might, you know, generate things that no one's ever thought of, but they'd be so alien and weird and and just not compatible with what humans are actually like that they wouldn't make sense. Um, so I think we have a way to go before AI is going to really help us with this. But I love the way everybody used the tools to illustrate in a, in a pretty nice way what they were thinking. Um, so I hope that, well, I hope that you felt, each of you felt like the tool did a reasonable job of showing what you had in mind. Um, so, you know, my, I, I don't, I have a lot of things to say, right? I really like the idea of including the younger generation in this, and I don't include myself in the younger generation. Um, because you know, when I when I talk to my kids and their friends and so on, there's a sense that we are failing them. Right? We have not laid out a future that they want to be part of. In fact, they look at the future that is coming as not uh, not giving them much to look forward to, uh, whether it's on the environment or jobs or the political environment, the sense of of alienation from their own society. So there's a lot of things that we need to fix. Um, 
my sense, I didn't get to join any of the groups because I was arguing with Olivier about stuff. Sorry. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. my sense was this was really uh, intense conversation. Um, I ran three workshops with the World Economic Forum. My original plan was get a bunch of economists, AI researchers, science fiction writers, futurists, lock them in a room <clears throat> and don't let them out until they answer this question. That might have worked, but then there was COVID. <laughs> so we couldn't lock them in a room at all. We could only do Zoom meetings. And I have to say those three, I think three, four hour Zoom meetings produced very little, uh, much less than the discussion produced today. Um, so I really think we have to do this uh, in person. And uh, you know, if, if virtual reality is gonna be the future of work, it's gonna need to be a lot better than Zoom meetings. Uh, for sure. Um, I thought the themes in the, the films we saw earlier were really interesting. There was a lot of emphasis on meeting unmet needs, uh, which I think, you know, for, you know, for the next 20 years, we might think of that as sort of the foreseeable future. I think that is where the effort, right? So getting from now to a world where everyone has, uh, you know, a reasonable quality of life, physical security, et cetera. Um, that is the job that we face. It's what the SDGs are about. Um, and if, if we use AI to help with that, then we're not displacing uh, human work. Um, so that would be good. Another theme that came out is the pleasure that we derive from working together, right? And I think this is a fundamental human need you know, maybe it's biological from back when we were small extended family groups uh, in, the, in the hunter gatherer period, but that seems like something that's just there, just like the need to go to sleep, the need to be together with other people working on something in common is just fundamental. Uh, but against that, there's also hopefully more leisure time. I think most people would want that. Uh, there's some evidence that hunter-gatherers only worked 15 to 20 hours a week. Um, you know, but then again, they only live 15 to 20 years, so this <laughs> wasn't all perfect. Um, but that means more leisure time. Um, and at the moment, I think in, in most Western countries, that um, the sort of the, the, the part of the world between work and family, right, those other social structures, this is something that sociologists have been observing for decades now, they have withered away. And we will need to figure out how to reconstruct those uh, and adjust them for this, this new world. But we need that kind of larger social engagement uh, as part of what it means to be, you know, to live a good life. Uh, I think, um, you know, the, the, the picture that I had in mind well, being an academic or being a professor, I suppose, was was a, a a class in future where we're training people how to be life architects, right? Which involves deep understanding of the psychology of the individual and what's going to work for that person. So it's a very it's a very different notion from the way we think about medicine today, the way we think about education today, which is much more, you know, there's a simple set of rules. You know, if you have this, 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 then you have this disease and you fix it with this thing, treatment, right? This is going to be a much more nuanced process that involves getting deeply into how each individual functions uh, and how then we can help them shape a life that they, that they will really find worthwhile, that they, they'll be glad to have lived. Right. And so I think that that is going to be a very noble profession and a very difficult one that we currently can't do because we don't have that understanding of human psychology. Um, and the last point I want to make is I should have two more points. One, one is uh, I spent a lot of time reading science fiction, uh, trying to find the non-dystopic future with AI. Right. There's 
any number of dystopias you can find. And, and science fiction writers will tell you that's because dystopias create good plots, right? They, they make you want to help the character overcome the dystopic environment and the forces of evil and whatever else it is. So it's difficult to write good plots in utopia because everyone's happy. They don't really care. They don't mind. There's no bad things happening, right? So it's difficult to do. But there are two, two science fiction uh, worlds that kept coming up that people kept pointing me to. One is the culture novels by Ian Banks, and the other one is the Star Trek universe. And uh, in culture, they have super powerful AI that basically makes sure everything is fine for people. Uh, and in Star Trek, they have the matter converters that just anything you want, you just ask the computer and it makes it for you instantly. So nobody has to work and so on. But there's a, an amazing degree of commonality in these two worlds, which is that only 0.01% of the humans feel that they have a meaningful role, right? Either they're in Starfleet or they're in contact, which is the culture version of Starfleet right, where they're, you know, exploring new parts of the universe, bringing new civilizations into their, uh, into the fold, uh, and all that, and that feels like really meaningful activity, everybody else wants to get into that, but they can't, uh, and so the problem remains unsolved, at least in the science fiction, right, they have not been able to do what you guys were trying to do this afternoon, um, so keep at it, because it's really, really important. Be before I give you the word, I suggest one thing is that we lock the door. <laughs> no, <because laughs> we, we, no, we have one question. I've, I've been given this task to, to ask you all this question is how to make sure that, uh, or how actually to, to bring as many people as possible into that discussion. And that's actually why we did this exercise. To, to make you work on, 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 on something very concrete, but also to get your inputs on what was needed, was what difficult on how to bring as many people from, uh, you said it, Jerome, and also Stuart, uh, uh, on board into that discussion. So for the, less, uh, the last, what, 10 minutes, I'd like to really address, and also hear from you. I don't mean this panel just to be from the panelists, but also have your inputs and your uh, uh, you know, uh, sensations of what the exercise wa was and was like. Uh, on how really to involve as many people, what, what, are, what should be the incentives, what should be the, you know, the words to describe this exercise to bring as many people as possible. I don't know if Tain, you were going to that direction with your remarks, but I'll start with you and then I really open the floor to, the, to, the, to all of you. So I think that we start where we are. We always start where we are and where we are is in, in a place of considerable, amazing agency a word that that's that's recurring um and uh the agency that we have is a, a privilege and a responsibility to ask ourselves well who's not here with me so if i start where i am in my sphere of influence i need to also look at who's not in the room with me who's not in my circle but might might be able to invite in or ask for invitation to learn fr from them. So I think that's that's the first thing we need to be doing is breaking open our access in a, a, a radical way. I mean, one concrete way, we're doing that with Leonardo, the International Society of Arts, Science and Technology and our partnership with Arizona State University is through our Cryptech incubator that asks disabled artists and advocates to uh, hack or crip technology innovation through an arts focused uh, uh, fellowship on technology innovation. A billion people on the planet identify as disabled, a number that's only growing with aging population and increasing disasters. There's a power in invitation that needs to happen for access to get everyone's input. Um, I think also we talked about the next generation. And I wanna suggest that we think about the now generation. And 
not that we would abdicate responsibility as uh, the age of a generation who would be in this room here now, um, but that we, we, we assert and, and answer the call of our responsibility to engage with the next generation and the older generation and the generations yet to come. So we think intergenerationally as the now generation because we need all of us right now. So, so that's that's how I would shift mm -hmm. to be thinking about how we get more people involved. So you used a good image to break windows and doors to let people in. My next question to you all now is how to make sure people will come in. How to what are the incentives? Yes, and then yeah. can you press on the button if that's not the case. <laughs> that we're working at the Kavli Center directed by Professor Stuart Russell. Um, it's a, a very small case, but we want to replicate working with the public library. And so first, not only informing about what AI is, because now well, people in the street are sometimes even afraid of AI, but really through a methodology, participatory methodology, listening to what their needs are in the community and helping to develop AI tools that can help that particular community, organizing a competition with students, getting financing, and from this pilot project, go to other cities and other communities. So I know it's very small, it's at a micro scale, but perhaps they're gonna be the, the same amount of people that we are here now, but they're gonna be children, youngsters, and so I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I run a tech education company and a big portion of our audience when we host events are non-tech minds, um, often quite young. Um, and it's people like fashion models and DJs. And I've realized if you want people to come to your conversations, you have to meet them where they are. Um, so for me, that will even mean I'll write about AI in Vogue so I can reach audiences where I know that they're going to be and to also deliver content in a way that's welcoming to people. I often find myself taking off my corporate hat um, and putting on my sneakers and making it so I'm as disarming as possible because I think with technology, people are overwhelmed and we've created this kind of learned helplessness where it feels like there's nothing that can be done. So I might as well just unsubscribe. But I think if you roll up your sleeves, you show that we're all in it together. There's not six or seven people coding the future. We all are, are building it. And the more voices in the room, the better. Um, and to also make things entertaining. And as unfortunate or fortunate as that may be in our attention economy, um, how you deliver the messages that you want people to listen to, well, how are they currently interpreting and downloading information? Uh, and you have to be present in that way as well. Any other suggestions? I, I was wondering, maybe, maybe if you go uh, further, um, once you grab, grab those people, how do you make sure they are not only interested, but also concerned and that they act afterwards? Yeah, I think if you give people a reason to feel inspired, um, and whether that is something that's going to transform their life or something that they want to change, it's how does that relate to somebody in that environment? So I'll give you an example. Um, if I'm going to talk to somebody or talk to an audience about synthetic biology and something far out in the future, and you meet them where they are with a technology like IVF that was once just as doom and gloom and scary, and you give people examples of how their life has already transformed um, and the ways in which maybe they already use AI. I mean, I can't get down the road without talking to Google. Um, so all of the different ways that kind of disarm and give pathways for people that they're already walking, they just don't realize. Any other suggestions? Yes, please. Okay, I think it's working. Hi, I'm Paola. I'm, I work for um, um, public-private organizations sponsored also by the Ministry of Finance, the Swiss one. And what we just organized, for example, last week was uh, because of the Point Zero Forum, this big uh, conference between Singapore and Switzerland. We were organized. We organized a community event. And though I have to do a lot with blockchain, no crypto, blockchain, um, my homework was to find like great minds. Uh, on AI and bring them and design something for the people from this forum, which are policymakers, and also to open to the public. And what we decided to do was to bring academics to, to, so that to, to show a little bit what is the fear area or not the area, what is tangible, not. Mm -hmm. Then we have 
real companies that have been working since a long time with AI besides OC and so on, but uh, like unit eight, which help companies to democratize and see how, if it makes sense or not. And then in the end, we did the, 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 we had the policymakers discussing what could be done. And we have analyzed also these uh, 365 pages of the European Union, which at the same time, is very nice idea, but it can hinder the development of startups because which startups has the, a, le a legal person which can look into this. So it was well, well, well taken. We had almost 200 people and um, we had refugees and also. Actually, exactly. So you mentioned experts, policymakers. How did you bring the, the laymen, laywomen also into that discussion? How I brought what? The, the general people, general public. We event bright. I mean, just putting out in forums here, uh, in, um, Discord groups, etc., and saying, "Okay, we have these people. We are going to target these these topics." Enroll because space is limited. NGO don't expect big food, but the people was telling us we don't care about the food. We want to learn what it is, and it was amazing the response and the interest, and I really appreciate it. I mean, I. I mean, Ayesha Piotti from the ATH was there. We had like really fantastic people and we make it very tangible. And I mean, this, this, there was this refugee, which was really, really like saying, oh, this is amazing that this can happen in Switzerland. Thank you very much. So you can open the door again. <laughs> uh, yeah, just final remark by Jérôme um, and then maybe all of not you. Not a remark, one... just a question. And maybe others can do remarks too. I have a question. Now that you have done the exercise today, if you have in turn, had to ask the questions to others, assuming that we can have be more inclusive, do the right outreach and find the right people. How would you ask the question about imagining the future that you desire? In what shape or form would you ask that question? Because we asked a question to you today in terms of a future where AI is omnipresent and how work will be. But there are so many ways that the future will be and without asking people to be forecasters or predictors, we're not trying to turn them into, into futurists. How would you ask the question to more people about how can you imagine the, your desired life and how would it look like? How would you ask that question? Um, I meant to mention that before. So I'm a physician um, and I, I, in our group, there were, I think a 50, 50 uh, percent reaction of negative uh, visions on AI to positive visions. And I think that um, I love the exercise with the eyes closed, but I think if, um, as a preface to that, you would have asked, what is the best version of yourself? And then immediately thereafter, attach the question of where work comes in. Because I find over and over when you ask patients or people I interact with that question, people don't have an answer ready, which makes me think that we go through life without actually asking ourselves that question with a projection into the future. And without having individually responded to that question, it's really hard to make predictions for others or participate in this kind of conversation. That's it. Yeah, Jérôme had a remark and then I think we'll, oh. we'll close the, the afternoon, but first Jérôme, yes? All right, thank you. Um, to jump on what you just said, it's true that we often know better what we don't like compared to what we like or what we want. You know, it's harder to know what we want. Um, in terms of participation and who do we include and how do we include people in this discussion about the future, um, we can look at it from a perspective of drivers and barriers. Um, of course, in terms of barriers, you will think of the digital divide, um, AI increasing this divide. If we think of quantum technology even more, when we look at the countries that are investing in quantum technologies, um, so who has access to this technology, digital skills, men, women, all of this, uh, we know. So the question is, what are the basic skills, the minimum knowledge that you need to have about a technology in order to be able to give, give an opinion um, or express your voice? And here I would like to mention um, the work of the University of Finland, uh, sorry, University of Helsinki, that has done an incredible job uh, on developing a website called Elements of AI, um, where you have really a basic understand explanation of what AI is in uh, most European languages. It's available to everybody for free. So it's elementsofai.org, uh, I think. Um, and the other point is, of course, drivers. 
Um, and and here um, the question again of agency: um, Why do I participate, and how meaningful uh, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, my participation is? Uh, and here, uh, when we look at the speed of the development of the technology, it's really difficult to also be included or to have an impact or a meaningful impact in in um, in this uh, future. So it's really an open question, and and indeed this this three C and one of them being the community is a key uh, a key element. And I do believe that Switzerland, with this experience of uh, direct democracy, has a role to play here, um, making sure that. Uh, we all have a say in this development. Thank you. I have one question to dear Stuart. Uh, the question is regard, do you believe or do you agree with the statement says that what we know is a drop in terms of what is being developed in private companies like Amazon, Google, because Elon Musk says that AI is more powerful than neural, um, neural. So the idea is what is being developed also in military research. So do we? It's a very technical mm -hmm. question, but maybe it's, Stuart knows the. Uh, it's it's a long answer, so I don't want to give the whole answer. Uh, mm -hmm. The military actually have a really hard time getting good AI people uh, because OpenAI is paying people $10 million a year. The military would offer the same person maybe 92,000 a year, right? So they just cannot compete at all. And it's a huge problem for national security, actually. So don't, that's not the, the issue. What the big companies have up their sleeves that they're not telling us I don't think it's I don't think it's like that. I mean, it might be starting to be like that, but the AI community is very collaborative, very open. Um, ideas really propagate quickly. Um, you know, so for example, transformers, which are the basis for language models, you know, Google just published that pretty much immediately when they came up with the idea. Um, they compete very fiercely to have the most papers in, in Europe every year. So that means they are laying open uh, most of their best work. But I am hearing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing that there is more stuff. Um, I was just talking with Olivier about uh, Gemini, a new model from Google DeepMind uh, that may be more powerful, but we'll see. Um, but I, I don't think there's a huge gap between what's publicly known and what what the field knows how to do. Very short. Okay. Just very quickly all about big, big tech, big companies. I mean, Amazon has released also a platform for machine learning for everyone to democratize the use where you don't have to be a coder. So you have, it's, it's a fantastic thing that everybody can can use given that they have a computer, it's an in internet, but I'm just saying there's also very nice um, uh, democratization uh, initiatives in these big companies. And for me to describe this was difficult to say, if I don't tell me, it's easier if somebody tells me time, time to imagine my future with AI. Just um, I first uh, suggest we applause our four uh, speakers for the panels. And now I give the word for the wrap up to Amir and, and Kitrona. Yes, Amir. So uh, we're really delighted to have you today. This was really interesting for us to learn from you. And uh, hopefully, the journey that we're embarking on will be uh, impacted by your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.